Good evening, everyone. We'll start with the tradition, not of the Pledge of Allegiance, but signing the sheet. Lest I carry that too far, um, I do go to a lot of the select board meetings here, and as, um, as, f as few people who as go to them regarding the budget of this town, it is refreshing to start with the Pledge of Allegiance because I can remember it. It's like, I'm not gonna persist, but when I, went to, when I joined the Rotary Club, they do group singing, and I thought, oh my God. I actually love group singing, and I can't sing, but I actually remember some of these songs, and it's like if a spirited person leads you in singing, hip, hip, hooray. Enough of that. I didn't change the agenda uh, for <laughs> All right, we're going to rock and roll. Um, I'm going to go back on script here. <clears throat> we are really honored to have Bob Peppermint Taylor here, and I'll introduce Professor Taylor in just a minute. Um, just a couple of things that are coming up, and I want to thank the sponsors and um, I will get out of the way. Um, the statewide sponsor of the Vermont Humanities Council's first Wednesday program is the Institute of Museum and Library Services through the Vermont Department of Libraries, your tax dollars at work. The series underwriter here is St. Johnsbury Academy. The underwriter of this talk is the University of Vermont Humanities Center, and what makes this program possible here year after year are the two sponsors, the Friends of the Athenaeum, buy a pie, make a pie, buy a book, bring a book, whatever. That's, they do great things for us. And Adler and McKay, PLC, right across the street. Uh, a couple of things that are coming up. On January 29th, we'll have the first lecture in the Arts and Culture series. Dan Swainbank will be talking about his new book about the Fairbanks. <laughs> Dan is here. Um, there are copies for sale here. Don't ask to buy them tonight because I have to make change. They're here all the time. We have a lot of copies, but that's going to be fantastic. That's uh, Wednesday, January 29th, 7 o'clock here. That's going to be fantastic. Uh, the Athenaeum is participating in the Vermont Humanities Council's uh, Vermont Reads program. This book is The Hate You Give. We'll have copies uh, available for you free to keep. We'll have a... Uh, a, uh, a book discussion about this. So we'll have lots of activities related to this book and the information will be out soon. Uh, the end of this month, we'll start doing that. Bob Pepperman Taylor is the Elliot A. Brown Green and Gold Professor of Law, Politics and Political Behavior at the University of Vermont where he has taught since 1986. He teaches courses in political philosophy and the history of political thought. He served as the founding dean of the UVM Honors College from 2003 to 2007. His scholarship focuses on American political thought and environmental ethics. Um, and I wanted to mention this just because it wasn't in the bio I got from the Humanities Council, but Professor Taylor was the winner of the 2016 George V. Kidder Outstanding Faculty Award by, given by the UVM Alumni Association. The award, given annually since 1974, honors full-time faculty for excellence in teaching and advising and their ability to inspire students and have a lasting influence on the lives and for, the po and for their positive impact on campus life beyond the classroom. And all of us have probably had those professors who you say, I'd take that class again because of that person. And that is what Professor Taylor was honored for and that's, that is um, a, an outstanding thing. His most recent book is Lessons from Walden, forthcoming in 2020, March of this year, uh, from the University of Notre Dame Press. And he'll speak more about the book during his talk. I am the person who asked him to bring the things that are on your seats. 30% off if you act now. Um, we're so close to seeing the book being published and it would be here, but it's March. So it's a great book and you'll want to buy it. And it was me who did this, not Professor Taylor. So without further ado, Professor Taylor, thank you. Thanks. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. It, it, it's, it's actually kind of an honor to be here. I, I, I've never been in this fantastic um, building before, and, and it's just such a pleasure to be here. And I'm also very impressed. You're very intrepid to be out uh, uh, on a cold winter's night. I kind of thought there might be two or three people who, who were lost uh, 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 and needed some warmth. Uh, do you need more uh, volume? Can you hear me? Okay, um, uh, but at any rate, it's, 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 it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you very much for, for coming out um, this evening. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about um, the book. I'm going to kind of give you the, the, the preamble to the book, as it were, the, the, uh, kind of the, the setup for, for where, where I got to, to, to the ideas that led to the book. Um, I, I, uh, I hadn't written about Walden, the, the, um, the, the great uh, uh, kind of uh, culminating work of, of Thoreau's. I'd, I'd written about his political ideas, his overtly political ideas. I'd written about his essay, his famous essay on civil disobedience, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, and, and then you know, what I'm going to do is try to explain how uh, I was led from, from civil disobedience to Walden and, and some of the ideas in, in, in Walden. So, so I'll try to be as clear as I can. On a late July uh, afternoon uh, in 1846, a, uh, an almost comic little drama uh, played out in the little village of Concord, Massachusetts. A 29-year-old failed school teacher by the name of Henry David Thoreau uh, uh, was uh, coming into the village. He was living currently uh, at his cottage in uh, his little cabin uh, by Walden Pond, where he lived for two years, two months, and two days. Uh, uh, he had come into town to get a shoe repaired at the cobbler. While he was in um, town, um, his friend, uh, uh, Sam Staples, who was the town constable, um, uh, said, Henry, you owe your poll tax. Uh, a poll tax was a, a head tax uh, on every voter um, in the state of Massachusetts. It was a buck and a half a year uh, uh, that every voter uh, owed the state of Massachusetts. When Thoreau came back from college, he was a, a voter. He was eligible to vote. He never did vote. He, he had not voted, and he never did vote in his entire life. But, uh, 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 but he, um, uh, uh, he refused to pay the tax, not because uh, he didn't want to vote. He refused to pay the, pay the tax because he thought that it supported a state, the state of Massachusetts, that was complicit in the support of the institution of slavery in the American South. And because of that, he refused to pay that particular tax. Sam Staples, who was kind of his buddy, a small, small town, uh, 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 Staples hunted and fished with uh, a throw from time to time. And uh, Staples, as the town constable, was responsible for um, paying the state of Massachusetts the taxes that were owed uh, um, uh, from uh, the local voters. And so Staples had to collect his buck and a half a year from Thoreau. Staples apparently stopped Thoreau and said, you know, Henry, are you hard up? Uh, uh, do you just not have the money? And he uh, apparently offered to pay the, the tax for Henry uh, uh, in, in the event that Henry needed him to. And Henry got mad. And uh, he said, no, no, I have plenty of money. Uh, I'm not paying it on principle. In, in fact, Thoreau had decided when he came back from college a few years earlier uh, to follow Bronson Alcott's um, uh, uh, example. Bronson Alcott, the father of Louisa May Alcott, uh, had, had already had a kerfuffle over his poll tax uh, uh, in a previous year. And so, um, uh, so Henry said, no, no, uh, like Bronson Alcott, I, I'm not paying because I, I, on principle, I'm not paying on principle. Before you know it, Staples said, you have to pay. Uh, Henry says, I'm not going to pay. They're poking each other in the chest. I, I don't know if they were poking each other in the chest, but they got mad. And, and they got mad at each other. And, um, and Staples says, I'm going to throw you in jail if you don't pay the tax. And um, Thoreau said, OK, throw me in jail. 
uh, Staples had no authority to throw him in jail, by the way. Uh, 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 Staples, Staples had the authority to, to confiscate a buck and a half worth of property from, uh, 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 from, from Thoreau. But they, they were mad, they were poking, and so because things escalated, got out of control, um, uh, Staples threw Thoreau in jail. He threw him into a cell in the, t in the county lockup in the middle of Concord uh, with a, a, a man who had burned a barn and was waiting trial. Um, and, and, and word spread quickly throughout the village of, 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 of Concord that you know Staples and Thoreau had had this argument and Staples had thrown Thoreau into jail and you know all that. A small town. Somebody came down and paid the poll tax uh, for, for Thoreau. Nobody knows who it was. It was probably, uh, Thoreau had many aunts, and they were, it was probably one of them came down, paid the poll tax. Staples' daughter came home and told Staples, the tax has been paid. You got to go let Henry out. And Staples said, my boots are off. He can wait. He can wait till the morning. <laughs> So he went to bed, Thoreau went to sleep in, you know, as much as he could in, in, in jail. And um, in the morning, Staples went to let him out, um, and Thoreau was still mad, and he wouldn't leave. Uh, 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 and, uh, and yeah, this is, um, that's kind of an idealized version of the event that, uh, uh, that, that I'm uh, uh, describing to you. Uh, Thoreau was so mad, he says, I'm not leaving, I, you know, I refuse to leave, Staples threw him out. At that point, Thoreau um, went and gathered his shoe from the cobbler, and as we'll come back to it in a few minutes, um, he says he then joined a huckleberry party. And that Huckleberry party um, uh, uh, was a group of people who were going up into a meadow up in, 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 the, in, in, in the hills um, to collect berries, to, to, to um, collect um, huckleberries. That's an interesting little comment that he makes that most people don't pay much attention to. Um, uh, and I'm going to come back to it. Now, two years after this event, in 1848, um, uh, uh, in response to what he claimed were inquiries by his neighbors. Thoreau gave um, two lectures at the Concord Lyceum, which is very much like this place, um, uh, uh, a place where people came and gave talks. And, and he gave two talks about this event, where he explained you know, what his political philosophy was, why he refused to pay his tax, how he thought the rest of us should be behaving, and all of that kind of business. In January of 1849, um, by the way, I do think there are some chairs still available here. Um, there's a few up front here if people want them. Um, yeah, raise your hand if you have a chair next to you. Great. Great. So um, uh, in, in, in January of 1849, Thoreau published this lecture, and he published it under the title of Resistance to Civil Government. The essay received next to no attention uh, uh, at the time. It was published in a volume of essays where Thoreau was the least, or one of the least known authors. Hawthorne was, was in this volume. Emerson was the big name uh, in the volume. Uh, the only uh, reviewer that even mentioned uh, Thoreau's essay after it appeared in this volume um, was a, 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 a woman in London writing for the People's Journal, uh, uh, some uh, 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 you know, socialist uh, newspaper in London. Um, and so people really didn't pay much attention to this, this essay, Resistance to Civil Government. Thoreau died um, uh, in 1862 of tuberculosis uh, uh, in his early 40s. And four years after uh, he died, in 1866, his sister and one of his friends edited a series of his essays uh, under the, uh, in a volume called Reform Papers. And when the essay appeared in Reform Papers, it had a new title. Uh, and the title was Civil Disobedience. And, uh, uh, and that's the title that most of us know the essay uh, 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 as today. 
And, but, but, but what's interesting about that is that we have no idea if Thoreau approved of the change of the title. I, ha I have no evidence that he um, ever used the phrase civil disobedience in his life. Um, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, I just want to point out that resistance to civil government has a significantly more militant sound uh, to it, uh, ring to it, than civil disobedience. Um, uh, my suspicion, uh, although I can't prove this, my suspicion is that his sister and his friend wanted to soften the tone of the essay a little bit uh, in light of the, you know, the horrible civil war that, uh, that had just completed. Um, uh, resistance to civil government uh, didn't sound quite as romantic in the light of the civil war. Uh, as it might have been in, in, in uh, 10 years before uh, that. Be that as it may, this essay, Civil Disobedience, is really Thoreau's, we might, we might think of it as Thoreau's apology. Uh, and I, I use that word in the, in, in, in the, in, in the way that Plato talk, talks about um, Socrates' apology. That is his explanation, uh, his, his, his defense of his own uh, views, his explanation for why um, uh, he refused to pay his poll tax. Now, some of you are familiar um, with this essay, um, and uh, uh, some of you may have read it many years ago, and some of you may have never read it at all. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about it um, uh, to, uh, to refresh your minds or to, uh, 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 to, 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 to actually, uh, those of you who haven't read it, you're just going to have to trust me on this. Uh, 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 I'll try not to lie too much uh, about it. First, and probably most famously, um, uh, Thoreau um, uh, uh, defends a, uh, a really robust conception of the supreme value of individual conscience in this essay. Um, uh, this is a famous uh, 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 passage. He says, must for the citizen ever for a moment or in the least degree resign his conscience to the legislator? Why is every man a conscience then? I think that we should be men first and subjects afterwards. It is not desirable to cultivate a respect for the law so much as for the right. Um, uh, and and uh, so, you know, this is a very strident uh, uh, position he takes. He, he champions this notion that our individual consciences uh, are of supreme imp importance uh, for us. Um, uh, for Thoreau, we're mistaken. If we think we're obliged to respect and obey the Constitution and the civil laws when they conflict with our consciences. Indeed, in Thoreau's mind, the current American government in the middle of the 19th century, at both the federal and the state level in Massachusetts, were hopelessly corrupted by their support for uh, and protection of the institution of slavery, as well as the imperial war with, with Mexico that was going on at the time that he uh, wrote the essay which he also believed was motivated by American uh, slavery and slave interests. Citizens, Thoreau claims, are disgraced by their association with the government. Our consciences, on the other hand, recognize higher moral laws and principles, and they make clear to us the horrors of slavery, if we only listen to them correctly. So most famously, Thoreau defends the conscientious individual against all claims that were morally bound to respect and support a state that is seriously, even fatally morally compromised by its entanglement with American slavery and any other great moral evil. Now, related to Thoreau's defense of individual conscience, is an attack on what we might think of as consequentialism. Now, I, I don't want to get bogged down in ethical theory here, but, but, but what I mean by consequentialism is what we might think of as cost-benefit analysis. This idea that the way to make a good moral choice is to weigh the options and take the least bad one. Um, uh, 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 and th that's the way many of us go about our lives, and by the way, I, I think there's perfectly good reasons to go about our lives that way uh, uh, a, a lot of the time. But Thoreau thinks that when it comes to very serious moral problems, that kind of moral thinking compromises us, and we uh, don't end up being honest about what we're facing. And so um, uh, 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 Thoreau uh, actually says um, uh, something um, that is pretty outrageous. He says, this people, 
must cease to hold slaves and to make war on Mexico, though it cost them their existence as a people. Okay. That's a very radical thing to say, right? It said it would be better to lose the nation than to continue to support any slavery within the nation. Now, some of you may know this, this contrasts quite radically with, for example, Abraham Lincoln's views. Abraham Lincoln said uh, famously that he would, uh, uh, he would support even a great evil if it meant uh, avoiding an even greater evil. <laughs> Right, uh, 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 and and so Lincoln's view is is much more of our commonsensical view that we need to you know weigh consequences and costs and benefits and kind of choose the least bad option. But Thoreau thinks that there are some things that are simply so bad that we shouldn't do them, even though the consequences of do, of not doing them may be horrible. But you just shouldn't do those things, uh, regardless. Consequences be damned. It's not only the American constitutional order that Thoreau attacks. He also attacks, under this kind of argument, democratic majoritarianism. Uh, uh, he, he, he equates voting with a kind of gambling or gaming, where he says, you know, when you vote, what you're doing is basically saying, here's my preference, but whatever the group decides is fine with me. And he's saying, nah, can't do that. You can't do that on really serious stuff, like slavery. Uh, it's so bad that he says, I don't care what the majority thinks. If they think we should support the institutions, they're wrong, and I will not support the majority's decision on this. So Thoreau's very critical of, of the American government, the American Constitution, and American political practices. For Thoreau, our primary problem isn't that we don't know right from wrong. It's rather that we find ourselves compromising our knowledge of right and wrong for two significant reasons. First, we're simply confused about our obligations sometimes. We, 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 we think we need to respect majorities when we don't need to, he thinks. We grant way too much respect to the government and to human law, he thinks. And second, we're corrupted by our own self-interest. And he talks in the essay a, a lot about how we need to be poor. Because when you're poor, people can't take anything from you. It, it, I, I, I consider this the, the, the Saturn principle. Uh, Saturn was an automobile that's no longer made. Uh, 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 and I owned a couple of them. Uh, they were the perfect automobile to own if you never wanted anyone to steal your car. Uh, 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 because nobody wanted them. They were fabulous. You could park them anywhere in America and they would be left alone. Uh, 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 and, uh, and so, you know, and so throw, it says if, if you want to not have people have power over you, don't have anything. Um, uh, it's not just that you won't have people steal things from you, the government won't have power over you if you don't have anything. Um, excuse me. Um, and, and so he throws things, we, we know that slavery is wrong, but we find reasons to adjust, and we mustn't do that, he thinks. In fact, he thinks that we need to be more courageous, and this is a famous sentence from civil disobedience. He says, oh, for a man who's a man, and as my neighbor says, has a bone in his back, which you cannot pass your hand through. Now, resistance to civil government, Thoreau suggests, is best achieved by withdrawing one's support from the government. And this is one of the surprising things for modern readers uh, when, when we read this essay, Civil Disobedience, because what we expect when we, when we pick up an essay called Civil Disobedience or Resistance to Civil Government, we expect advice about political organizing, we expect you know, strategic plans for you know, how to get your, you know, your political ideas enacted. That's not what we find. Thoreau says, cut loose. Don't give your support. Live independently from the government. Thoreau's resistance takes the form of a moral renunciation and a refusal to politically engage unjust institutions. He demand, his demand is for us to stand outside of both the slavery-based economy 
and the political order that protects and makes this economy possible. I do not hesitate to say, he writes, that those who call themselves abolitionists should at once effectually withdraw their support, both in person and property, from the government of Massachusetts. By this, Thoreau meant that we should not participate in political life, either by voting or by paying taxes, and that we must arrange our lives so as to uh, require no services from the government. I'm exaggerating a little bit. He does say, I, I'm willing to pay taxes for roads because I'm, I'm going to use them, but I'm not willing to pay taxes for other things that, that I don't want to use. Injustice requires that we withdraw from unjust institutions. And the creation, what we need to do is to create a personal life that makes such a withdrawal possible. While we might expect, as I said, in a document like this, political advice, what we find is, is remarkably um, kind of personal and private advice about pulling away. It's a curious fact, to, to my mind, that one of the most significant documents in the American political tradition is a remarkably apolitical document in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, it just, you know, those of us who want to know how to organize, how to, you know, how to, um, uh, 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 to engage the government, this document just doesn't tell us much about that. And it's interesting that this document has become a central text in the American political tradition. A couple of years ago, one of my colleagues, Alex Zakaris, who teaches with me in the political science department at, at the University of Vermont, was on a, a national public radio um, call-in show uh, about uh, this essay, Civil Disobedience. And the, the moderator, the, the, the host of the show, was so excited to be talking about Thoreau's civil disobedience, and, and, and my, my colleague had to kind of talk her down a little bit because she, she got, got to the point where she said, you know, it may be the most important document in the history of the world. Uh, uh, it's, it's not. Uh, 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 there, are, there are more important documents than, 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 than this one. And in fact, this document really was ignored in the American political tradition for the first hundred years of its life. And, it's true that Leo Tolstoy and uh, Mohandas Gandhi, um, uh, at, at the top row there, uh, read uh, Civil Disobedience and were influenced by it. Uh, Emma Goldman uh, 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 and Upton Sinclair in the United States were, were, were influenced by, by um, this uh, essay as well. But it wasn't until Martin Luther King Jr. in 1962 uh, made a, a, a written comment about this essay. That's when this essay really entered the political canon in, 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 in America. And, and King said, during my early college days, I read Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience for the first time. I was fascinated by the idea of refusing to cooperate with an evil system. Uh, I was so deeply moved that I reread it several times. I became convinced that then that non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. No other person has more, been more eloquent and passionate in getting this idea across than Henry David Thoreau. The text continues um, from the civil rights movement and the student movements of the uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, it continues to uh, influence um, environmental uh, uh, activists today. This is just one example of a, a, a journalist uh, turned activist named Gwen Stevenson. Uh, this book about uh, how to fight against climate change, how to politically organize against uh, uh, climate change, um, the animating hero of the book is, is Thoreau from, from beginning to end. Over the course of the past um, half century or so, or so, Thoreau's essay has gone from obscurity to great importance. And so given its importance, I've spent a lot of time looking at what other people have said about why it's important. And I'm just going to very try to briefly summarize the volumes and volumes and volumes of literature that had, has been produced about this essay. Uh, 
Perhaps the oldest and most common form of criticism is to simply say that Thoreau's nuts. And it's he's nuts because he was crazy. That's not a real great argument to make, but, uh, uh, but, but uh, this, some of you may have read the New Yorker magazine uh, a couple of years ago when Catherine Schultz wrote a, an essay about Thoreau called Pond Scum. <laughs> yeah. She really liked him. Uh, 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 that, was the, that was the picture that uh, uh, accompanied uh, uh, the essay. Uh, it, it, reading Schultz reminds me of reading Jefferson. Jo Thomas Jefferson wrote a, a letter to James, uh, John Adams in 1814 about reading Plato's Republic, which is, happens to be my favorite book in the world. Uh, uh, but um, uh, 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 here's what Jefferson said about reading Plato. While wading through the whimsies, the puralities, the unintelligible jargon of this work, I laid it down often to ask myself, how could it have been that the world should have so long consented to give reputation to such nonsense as this? That was Jefferson on Plato. Schultz says the same thing about Thoreau. Uh, 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 that, that, that's more or less what she says. And, and Schultz comes from a long line of, uh, of commentators. Uh, uh, in Thoreau's own time, uh, somebody that went to college with him uh, uh, by the name of, uh, 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 of James Russell Lowell. Some of you may know that name. Um, uh, uh, Lowell thought very much the same thing. He said, Thoreau had not a healthy mind. Uh, uh, and he said he had no, he had no sense of humor. Uh, he was not a strong thinker, uh, but he was a, a strong feeler. Uh, um, it, that was not a compliment. Um, a few years later, in 1880, Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, Treasure Island, your fame, um, uh, described Thoreau as a skulker and a prig. Uh, 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 not very friendly. Uh, Stevenson changed his mind, by the way, uh, uh, a little later on when he learned more about Thoreau. But overall, much of this literature thinks that Thoreau is, is just kind of crazy and doesn't, he's, he doesn't need to be taken very seriously. And, and, and you find this over and over and over again in the literature from the 18, you know, uh, 70s uh, to our own uh, time. An element of this argument is often that Thoreau didn't understand that he was himself a threat to democracy. Thoreau thought he was championing the individual conscience and all this stuff, but if you live in a world where people with strong consciences disagree with one another, what happens when You've got that situation. By the way, it should sound somewhat familiar. Uh, 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 it's not unknown in our own moment uh, to, to, to see this. Um, uh, and so some people in this tradition think, you know, Thoreau just, he, didn't, he couldn't think his way out of a paper bag. He, he, he makes this argument for strong conscience, but what he ends up doing is, is pitting conscientious people against each other when conscientious people disagree, if all you have is individual conscience, if you don't appeal to democracy, if you don't appeal to something else, you just gonna have people yelling at each other. And, you're, and eventually somebody's gonna have to force somebody else to do something. Um, uh, and, and, and so weirdly and perversely, this first line of argument goes, Thoreau ends up producing kind of an anti-democratic set of ideals, but he does it unconsciously. He does it because he doesn't know what he's doing. That's, if I made it sound negative enough, you get the point, right? Uh, these people don't like these ideas. There's a second interpretation that is quite common, and that is that Thoreau wasn't crazy. He was perfectly well aware of what he was doing. He just didn't believe in democracy. He didn't. You know, he, he wanted to assert his own independence. He was unwilling to listen to his neighbors. Um, uh, uh, and he was, you know, this, this strong, conscientious individual uh, just simply didn't believe in democracy. And so the second big argument that you find commonly 
is that Thoreau, it's not that he was nuts or that there were unintended consequences to his ideas, it's that he was just a straight up, honest, anti-democrat. Didn't really like democracy very much. Now, in contrast to those who paint Thoreau as an anti-democrat, either unknowingly or knowingly, there is a generation of contemporary interpreters who try to rescue Thoreau from this kind of criticism that we've seen so far. They believe that Thoreau is actually engaged in a democratic project of great importance. All of these people admit that he's not a real systematic philosopher, but they want to claim that he's deeply concerned in civil disobedience with a project at the heart of all serious democratic life, and that is how to encourage the development of responsible individuals. Right? People who, who, who really are morally responsible and have the strength of character to resist tyranny uh, in any form it can take. If it's true that democracies can at time make terrible mistakes, democratic citizens need to have the independence of mind and the strength of character to speak out and, as Reverend King notes in his praise for civil disobedience, to refuse cooperation with evil at times. A man named George Kaytab, who teaches at Princeton University, has argued that Thoreau, along with Emerson and, and Walt Whitman, promote a kind of democratic individuality that's a, a very powerful and important part of, of, of democratic life. A, a woman who teaches at Johns Hopkins named Jane Bennett uh, are, makes a similar argument, uh, uh, suggesting that civil disobedience is really about how we become citizens capable of civil disobedience. It, it doesn't tell us how to do civil disobedience. It, tell, it tells us that we need to become people who are capable of it. Arguments of this sort view Thoreau as an important and responsible critic within the democratic camp. And they've become quite popular in a contemporary um, generation of readers of civil disobedience. And I myself have contributed to that literature from time to time. I'll admit, however, that there's one more interpretive strain that I find myself provoked by and challenged by. In order to explain this, let me uh, 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 admit that I find the debates that I've described so far, and which are very common in the secondary literature, I find them to be explaining less and less about what I think is important, about what's going on in Thoreau. They seem to me to miss, at the end of the day, the most important part of Thoreau's little essay on civil disobedience, or at least the ele element that keeps continuing to resonate in our current political environment. The ideas I keep coming back to aren't Thoreau's critique of consequentialist morality or his critique of voting and majoritarianism or his demand for moral courage or his brief for defense of individual conscience. Instead, I think the most important ongoing appeal of this little essay is actually represented by an obscure and usually overlooked comment that Thoreau makes at the end of his discussion of his arrest. And I've alluded to this comment al already. When I was let out the next morning, I proceeded to finish my errand and having put on my mended shoe, I joined a huckleberry party who were impatient to put themselves under my conduct. They wanted to be led by Thoreau because Thoreau was a naturalist. He knew where the berries were, right? Uh, uh, and in half an hour, for the horse was soon tackled, we had the cart on the horse, was in the midst of a huckleberry field on one of our highest hills, two miles off, and then the state was nowhere to be seen. After his confrontation with the state, Thoreau retreats to the countryside with others, whom he leads, by the way, to gather wild fruit. I hope those are huckleberries. 
They said on the web they were huckleberries. I just am waiting for somebody to say, those aren't huckleberries, you huckleberry. Uh, 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 you know, uh, but um, I'm, I'm told those are huckleberries. There are both literal and symbolic meanings to Thoreau's comment. Literally, the village is out of sight, along with the institutions of governance and economy that Thoreau objects to so strenuously. He's in a space uncorrupted by slavery and selfishness, a place that's friendly, that's free, and represents a kind of natural abundance. Symbolically, there's just a hint that such natural places produce a healthy, educative, liberating fruit. Here, huckleberries play that role. In other parts of Thoreau's writing, he writes about wild apples in the same way. The village of Concord makes Thoreau think of historically ancient and corrupt European institutions. The contrast with the huckleberry field is the contrast between unjust conventional society and free just society, between custom and nature, with the former corrupt and the latter pure and free. The huckleberry, a, free, a fruit that's freely given by nature, symbolizes this freedom. It's nourishing, it's freely growing, and it's free to gather. The group of people that gathers is also free. This is a purely spontaneous, voluntary group which has leadership but no coercion. There are no jails or poll taxes or constables or slavery or imperial war among this group of people. Now in this single sentence, Thoreau, I think, lays the foundation for a tradition of environmental thinking that continues to flourish if only as a minority view, even within environmentalism and within the movement as a whole. Early in my career, when I was studying the tradition of environmental ethics and nature writing in America, I distinguished between what I called the pastoral and the progressive traditions of environmentalism. The progressive tradition grows out of the progressive era of, of uh, American politics, Teddy Roosevelt and, and John Muir there in the Yosemite. Uh, um, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, uh, was, was a great conservationist, of course. The progressive tradition of environmentalism um, has blossomed into modern concerns with sustainability, with environmental management, uh, with public health. And this is by far the dominant tradition of environmentalism. It's concerned less with transforming American democracy than with effectively managing the natural resources and public health necessary to maintain it. The pastoral tradition with deep Jeffersonian roots, finds its first genius in Thoreau, I think. And we find in this obscure comment from civil disobedience about the huckleberries, the guiding principles for what would become his most famous book, Walden. Um, uh, it, that's the passage that leads to Walden, I think. Now, I haven't sufficient time this evening, and now, we could spend a couple more hours, three or four more hours, but I, I'm guessing that we all have to go home uh, at some point here. Uh, I haven't sufficient time to tease this tradition out in great detail, but I do believe it has grown and flourished as, as a more radical strain of American environmentalism than that found in the conservation and resource management uh, tradition. It's represented more by the back to the land movements, for example, than it is by the EPA. Thoreau's thesis in this obscure passage from Civil Disobedience, as well as in his book Walden and other writings, is that living closer to nature would help us to focus on the truly important parts of life, rather than being seduced by wealth and the marketplace. It would teach us a kind of modesty in our relationship with the rest of creation, a modesty sorely missing, he thinks, in modern industrial society. It would help us to promote the well-being of others by not requiring goods and status built upon the exploitation of others and other forms of injustice. There would be consequences, Thoreau believes, of taking his advice in Walden to simplify, simplify, simplify. That's one of the most famous sentences in the book Walden. Living closer to nature, 
to what he says in, in his essay, Walking, uh, 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 would teach us that in wildness is the preservation of the world. When we look closely at what he has in mind with wildness, it wasn't the Yosemite that John Muir and Teddy Roosevelt were standing next to. The wildness was found in our pastoral backyards, in our farms, in our local villages. Um, uh, uh, Thoreau was a, um, a, a village man, uh, not a wilderness uh, man uh, uh, over, overall. Now we're in a position to understand what I identify as the fourth and final line of criticism of Thoreau's work a line of argument that I find most poignant and challenging and dis distressing to me. More than half a century ago, there was an intellectual historian at Harvard named Perry Miller. And he published an essay in 1962 or something like that called The Responsibility of Mind and the Civilization of Machines. This was way before the web. Uh, uh, as the world becomes increasingly mechanized, Miller says, and technologies come to drive our society in such powerful ways, how are we to maintain control of our individual lives? Our economies and ways of life now come to seem more given than chosen, and the dynamism of our societies seems outside of our control, Perry Miller argues. He reflects on those writers like Thoreau from the 19th century who distrusted and resisted the development of what he calls the machine, what we might call industrialization in the modern world. What they hoped to do was to culti cultivate a pastoral simplicity and a kind of self-sufficiency for American citizens. In the time since Miller published his essay in 1961, Countless readers have been drawn to Walden's vision of an alternative and less alienating, if less affluent, economy. To his promotion of what we might think of as alternative neighborly communities. Miller's judgment about this vision, however, is very damning. He says Thoreau was irrelevant in his own time. Given the overwhelming chorus in the 19th century for the machine, and he, and like-minded writers, Thoreau and like-minded writers, quote, provide us today with no usable program of resistance. You know, the machine's in the garden. <laughs> that is, the trains are there. The, you know, the industrialization has come to the countryside. It's not going away. Rejecting the modern age is simply not in the cards, Perry Miller writes. The only grown-up or realistic attitude is to consider ways of controlling rather than rejecting or avoiding what Miller is calling the machine and what we may simply call the modern world. From this perspective, civil disobedience like Walden is best understood not as democratic or undemocratic or even as incoherent. It's best understood to be simply irrelevant. It's best understood as not speaking to us anymore. If Miller is right that Thoreau's recommendation was romantic and unrealistic in Jacksonian America, consider how much less connected to social and political reality it may be in the 21st century. What I'm suggesting is, I suppose, not all that surprising. I think that Thoreau is most interesting as an environmental writer. I don't think his contributions to more general categories of liberal and democratic theory, his use of the idea of consent or, or his idea of the conscience, rise to the level of, that continue to profoundly teach and inform us. He was led in his own rebellions, however, to think about our relationship to nature and how that relationship with nature informs our relationships to one another and how that influences our practice of freedom and independence.
His personal rebellion led him to begin developing a set of claims that would inform what I'm calling the pastoral tradition of American environmentalism, and which Perry Miller thought was not very helpful. Now, I think it's actually more helpful than Perry Miller does. <laughs> the environmental tradition that Thoreau continues to inspire reflects his impulse to withdraw. His focus on personal and local reform as a task prior to the engagement with the broader currents of political and economic life. Consider as an example the work of Wendell Berry. Um, uh, some of you may be familiar with Wendell Berry, a great novelist, a great poet, a great farmer, uh, a great environmentalist, a very interesting uh, uh, man, I think one of, one of our most interesting uh, uh, people. Um, Barry, uh, like Thoreau, believes, and these are his words, that the great enemy of freedom is the alignment of political power with wealth. Like Thoreau, he argues for an agrarian economic simplicity and independence, and that we need to resist the most extreme versions of the Enlightenment project of making nature conform to human will. In language that resonates with Thoreauvian theme, he writes, the problem that ought to concern us first is the fairly recent dismantling of our old understanding and acceptance of human limits. Barry has inherited from Thoreau and from many others, of course, a distrust of capitalism and market society, and even to a greater degree of development than Thoreau, he promotes an agrarian vision of relative economic self-sufficiency. He wants a nation of household economy, uh, uh, household economies is what he promotes. He explicitly suggests that we need to learn to live with less and that our freedom depends upon this and that without a return to economically productive, that is significantly self-sufficient households, we'll lose our capacity for neighborliness and a strong commitment to place to the health of both the natural and the social worlds around us. Despite his sometimes strident individualism, Thoreau gives us reasons to believe that with proper care and commitment, we can build meaningful personal and collective lives slowly and carefully. He calls this neighborliness in his writings. Barry is a contemporary thinker and writer and farmer who has developed and promoted these ideas to great effect for over half a century. In fact, we might think of Barry as among the grand inspirations for the modern movement most closely capturing Thoreau's spirit, it seems to me, and that's the local food movement. We currently have, as you're well aware, a small army of hardworking farmers out there, young, a lot of young farmers out there trying to uh, uh, you know, build new forms of agriculture that are well instructed by modern science, but nonetheless committed to living more harmoniously, uh, respectfully and carefully with the land than uh, does, uh, in their view, much industrial agriculture. This movement is young and evolving, but inspiring from a Thoreauvian perspective. Uh, you could read Bill McKibben's walk through the, the Champlain Valley, where he talks about uh, a lot of these types of developments in Vermont. Uh, 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 you could also read um, a book called The Dirty Life, which I think is a wonderful title for a book, especially by a farmer, uh, 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 by Kristen Kimball, um, who uh, she and her husband have a, a a farm uh, in, in New York State across uh, uh, Lake Champlain from, uh, from Burlington area. Um, but Thoreau and his legacy has to teach us is less about direct political engagement than it is with personal and local reform and the long, slow building of the kind of lives that resist the wealth and comfort and temptations to power in the modern world. The faith of this tradition is that such moderation is a necessary first step in freeing ourselves from institutions built, in, built on the kind of wealth requiring economic, uh, political, and ecological exploitation. The plan, it seems to me, in this tradition is to lay the foundations for a more restrained and locally grounded uh, type of democratic society. Now, I'm simply reporting this evening 
that I find much of interest in this tradition. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of uh, very admirable uh, projects uh, growing out of this tradition, a lot of admirable people uh, working within this tradition. My most uh, recent book, which was mentioned earlier, which will appear in another couple of, uh, another few weeks at the end of March, I guess. Um, in this book, I, I, I argue that there are three big ideas that grow out of this Huckleberry's passage from civil disobedience and inform the text of Walden. And once again, some of you have read Walden and many of you haven't, but even those of you who haven't read Walden will recognize probably the themes that I'm about to mention. Uh, uh, the three big themes. One is that we should simplify our life. I, I, I quoted the simplify, simplify, simplify passage. The second big theme is that we should march to the rhythm of our own drummer. A kind of individualism, a kind of uh, respect for individual eccentricity and the, the, the developing of our own personal lives, uh, uh, a kind of non-conformism uh, that, that Thoreau promotes. And the third is the idea that nature, ha nature isn't just a set of resources for us to use. Nature has lessons, moral lessons for us. And these three claims are central to the text of Walden. And in the book, what I do is I, I, I think about what it might mean to take those lessons seriously. And I'm willing to, that's another lecture. Uh, 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 I don't think that these lessons give us a real strong, plausible political program for emergency management. I don't think there's anything in Walden that'll tell us how to get out of our immediate political crisis um, uh, uh, that, that we're experiencing in the United States today. Nor do I think um, that taking Thoreau's ideas seriously does more than suggest to us what we should be thinking about. I don't think that Thoreau has our answers for us, but he points in directions that could be uh, useful for laying the foundations of a more environmentally and politically responsible kind of citizenship. Assuming that our political regime uh, survives its contemporary problems, and let's, let's hope that it does, uh, 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 Thoreau gives us a great deal of food for thought about reforming ourselves and our communities uh, into the future, uh, and laying foundations for the future. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, uh, thank you very much you, uh, uh, for listening. I, I would be happy to take any questions. Let me, let me uh, before I do, let me just um, see if I can figure out how to do something. I would like to... I would like to just put his picture back up there if I could figure out how. There we go. I'll put his picture back up. By the way, the famous beard, it, it, it came very late in his life. Uh, he didn't wear it most of his life. He, he was dying of tuberculosis. He wanted to keep his neck warm. Uh, uh, that's, that's the reason for the beard. Uh, he was like, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. It was really excellent I was just curious. Uh, in your explanation of Huckleberry, uh, uh, talking about how it represented in some degree a little bit of civil disobedience and the willingness to disobey laws that you disagree with, but also the willing, unwillingness to go along with laws that you thought were evil. If I wondered if that influenced a generation about a generation later, Mark Twain, in choosing Huckleberry as a name for Finn, because that represents a similar thing. He went down, he was going against the best wishes of his family and local society and for what he thought was right and he also went with an escaped slave, you know, which was not cooperating. And so I kind of wonder if Huckleberry didn't represent to him what it also represented to Thoreau. You know, I just wish that I could say that, that I knew that Mark Twain had read uh, 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 Thoreau. I, I have no evidence that he did, uh, 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 but I would love to think that there was a connection there. I just don't know of it, uh, uh, but it's a lovely one. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, Huckleberry Finn is is a wonderful representation of some of the very ideas that, uh, that Thoreau has in mind. I think you're absolutely right. 
I'm guessing that it's a little bit like the invention of calculus. Uh, two people did it, it you know, it, independent of each other. I, 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 don't, I don't have any reason to, I don't know of any connection between the two writers, uh, except they were both lecturers, but, you know, it, uh, but that's very interesting. Well, you're on the Huckleberry, there's a quote from Emerson, which you, you'll have a complete, but something to the effect that you criticize him. Saying he could have been something like he could have engineered for America. He's leading the Huckleberry. Yeah, no, I, Emerson didn't get him. Uh, you know, which is it's, that's a that's a silly thing for me to say. I mean, Emerson knew him. They were friends. They lived in the same. You know, Thoreau lived in his house. You know, but I just think that that eulogy that he gave when, when Thoreau died. I think that comment just misses such important things about Thoreau, and I, it makes me wonder if I'm crazy. You know, I mean, Emerson was a smart. Yeah, word has it, Emerson was a smart guy. Uh, uh, but but I um, I just always thought that that famous comment he says, instead of engineering for all of America, he engineered for Huckleberry Park. You know, go figure. You know, what, what's the good of that? Um, well. You know, Thoreau had a view about what was good about him. Uh, and uh, Emerson didn't quite get it, I think. Yes? I didn't understand when you said if he didn't um, support a particular law or something, then he wanted to step away. But how did he justify it? Like you did about your car. With slavery, slaves had absolutely no power at all, yeah. and yeah. It, you know, yeah. how did he justify not reaching out? You know, there are his public comments and his private actions. These are different things. Throw moved people along the Underground Railroad. He was acting. You don't talk about those things. Right? Um, uh, and and th th one of the things that's interesting about Thoreau is that he, we don't think of his writings as fiction, but the figure, Henry David Thoreau, that appears in his writings is an invented character. Okay? Uh, uh, it's his persona that he is presenting to the world. The real biography, the real man, was not just the same. He was not exactly the same as the man that's presented in his books. Um, uh, um, yeah, he was he was creating a persona, a public persona. But I, I think that there's a couple of things that you say that are really interesting and important. We do know that Thoreau participated in the Underground Railroad, that he, you know, that he risked his liberties, at least, if not his life, to do that at times. Lots of people in Concord did. There's nothing special about Thoreau. Concord was full of people who were much more active than him, okay? like his sisters, for example. Um, he didn't join abolitionist organizations like his sisters and his mother. Um, uh, uh, he, uh, you know, he and Emerson both were reticent about joining political organizations. Thoreau thought that he had more to say to his neighbors than he did to people living as slaves in South Carolina. His proposal to withdraw instead of engage it sounds weird to us, but it wouldn't have sounded weird at his time. He says in civil disobedience, in secular terms, what many people in Concord said in religious terms it, during his lifetime. You had to boycott goods from the South. You couldn't buy sugar. You know, you couldn't buy, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, rice from the South. You, you couldn't buy anything that was produced uh, by uh, slave labor. So the boycott movement, he's suggesting something very much like the boycott movement, which was not unique to him. It was very common among abolitionists. 
the abolitionists, strains of abolitionism also believed um, in what they called disunion. That is not being in the union with slave states. They wanted Massachusetts to withdraw from the union. And so when Thoreau said those things, it sounds kind of wild to us today. In the context of his own world of Concord at the time, there were, there were Bronson Alcott saying stuff like that too. There were, there were other people around. There was a real strong strain of Christian anarchism in the abolitionist movement in Concord and around that area uh, and, and around Massachusetts. So at any rate, that's, and I guess there's one other comment that I'd make. I don't think Thoreau's particularly good on what slave, uh, slaves experience and go through. He hates slavery. He believes that slavery should be abolished. But he was not engaged in immediate struggle against the institution itself the way that Garrison was. Or the way he did support John Brown. And he was the great, you know, Thoreau was the greatest white supporter of John Brown after the raid. Um, uh, uh, and, and so, you know, Thoreau's militants can be seen there. But he was not, there were plenty of abolitionists who thought that Thoreau should be more active and not withdraw so much. I'll put one other thing. You're making me think of all these things. He, one of his great essays is called Slavery in Massachusetts. Uh, it's, it's kind of, I think in many ways, it's his greatest abolitionist essay. And that essay was delivered in Framingham, Mass, on the 4th of July as a fill-in for Frederick Douglass, who had to flee the country <laughs> because of um, uh, uh, fears that he was implicated in John Brown's raid. And um, uh, so, the, it, so it, Thoreau was somewhat engaged, but not as, as much as many other people in Concord and, uh, and, and in the abolitionist movement. Yes? OK, thanks for being Well, just quickly, two things about nature. Yes. Um, when I was in the Air Force, I was stationed at uh, Hampton, which is right outside of Concord. Uh -huh. Years. And uh, so I, I had read Walden Plot, so I, I wanted to see it when yeah. I got there in 1991. Yeah. And I was like, there's not anything like you envision. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it, it, it's, you know. So hot, kind of square windows. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's not like, matter of fact, but when you go and you go to Mount Concord and see the history of it, you can see what it was like. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, uh, I climbed Mount Katahdin, uh -huh. which is the highest peak on the Appalachian Trail. Yes. And you got to the very top. Yeah. And I mean, it's, a, it's an all-day climb, yep. and here's his stream, the spring, and it's called the Bell Spr yep. Spring. Yep. So apparently he was really into mountains. For those of you who have not read his account of going up Mount Katahdin, I'm going to report to you that it freaked him out. <laughs> <laughs> it completely freaked him out. It, it, was the, it was one of the weirdest passages in all of his writings is, is, is the passage that he wrote about being up on that mountain. Yeah. It was all fogged in. He climbed, you know, he didn't have good gear the way that, you know. I was on Mansfield once in my jeans and wool coat in winter and a bunch of people all geared up came by and said, oh, you can die out here like that. But, you know, Thoreau was not geared up as well as I was uh, on that day. And, and uh, uh, he was up there, it was a wild scramble. Um, uh, uh, and he, in this passage, he says, we don't really belong up here. We belong down. The gods of the mountains are not the same as the gods in the valleys. We, in the valley, you know, go farm your farms. Uh, uh, he was sympathetic to the Indians um, uh, who thought that was sacred. And, you know, that's where the gods live. That's not where people go. Yeah. Just uh, in terms of all of that, not to tell you, it's a high mountain. It's nasty weather. It's actually on the Appalachian Trail. There are higher mountains in North Carolina. In North Carolina. Mount Mitchell is much higher than the Mount Washington. You know? yeah. Yeah. And it, it's on the Appalachian yeah. Trail. The other thing I was going to suggest, one of the reasons he was concerned about uh, slavery, it wasn't just South Carolina. Even the state slaves, states in the North had slaves. And Massachusetts and the North, New York, Massachusetts, 
lower Connecticut, the Outer Island Manchester, had big mills that processed all the cotton that came That's from itself, and they made, they brought in the market for all the, That's all the slaves. So, so the North was uh, implicated. Uh, 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 like a significant part of, of the slave. Uh, Northern investment in the sugarcane fields in the Caribbean was extensive as well. You know, so Brown University as well. North had a hand. In fact, for Lincoln went to speak in New York of the trying to convince he was expected in New York to succeed with the South until he was able to <coughs> turn that around with his speech. Right. With, and he turned it around so New York decided to stay with New York. Right. But, the, but they were in New York and many northern states thought about seceding yeah. also. There is a, a comment in civil disobedience that most readers don't know what it's about. It's a very obscure comment about an, a foreign port in South Carolina. It's just a little comment. You can look it up. Uh, um, um, and about my neighbor who went down. Thoreau actually thought that our entanglements with the slave economy were corrupting us in all sorts of important ways. South Carolina was extremely worried about smuggling abolition uh, literature uh, through a trade into uh, the South, right? And uh, you know, David Walker is uh, you know a great uh, African American uh, abolitionist who wrote a pamphlet that that was very powerful and important, and it was smuggled in on a Massachusetts. But one of the few good careers that free black men could have in Massachusetts was to be a seaman, right, to, to be a merchant marine. Uh, um, uh, and, and so, you know, Massachusetts um, ships frequently had black sailors, free black sailors. And South Carolina passed a law that said any boat coming in with a black person on it. That black person had to be surrendered to the constable when the boat docked, put in jail, until the boat was about to leave, at which point the captain of the ship would have to pay for the room and board for that, you know, that sailor, and then remove them from South Carolina. This was, of course, a terrible, you know, insult, uh, and um, uh, a, a number of times it's happened. Thoreau's neighbor, a guy named Hoare, H-O-E-R, um, had been he'd been a congressman, and he was sent by the, uh, the governor of Massachusetts to South Carolina to negotiate an end to this law, and he was driven out of town by mom. And, uh, uh, and, and chased out of South Carolina back to Massachusetts. These were not good times. <laughs> and so I said, you know, we shouldn't be doing business with these people. We're, we're, we're compromising ourselves so much, they're humiliating us. It, you know, that, that's the kind of argument that, that, was, that was being made. Should, should we stop? Thank you so much for coming out.